Thank you, Dixie. I thought I was going to have to get serious for a minute here. So, everyone quieted down. Really appreciate it. We're thrilled to be here today. Hey, any of you guys have pets? Who's got pets here? Lots of you have pets. You know, I got two dogs. I got two cats. I got ten chickens. Uh, they're all rescues. And, you know, we live in one big happy family. All the humans and the animals. And, you know, I just think it would be a great world if we could all have this sort of interspecies communication. You know what I'm talking about? Like being able to relate. Do you guys talk to your dogs? Are you those crazy dog and cat owners who talk to their animals? Because I am. I talk to my chickens and they talk back to me and I've actually learned a lot of the different sounds that they make. You know, they have different sounds. So I know when there's a, a bobcat kind of roaming the perimeter of our yard or or you know, I mean it's you learn to hear, they learn our language, we can learn theirs as well too. And I just think it'd be great if we could just, you know, live as one planet, interspecies communication throughout all, you know, just have like the, the local deer come to your house for dinner and you know you're just getting down with all the animals and I've been thinking lately about not just the kind of dogs and cats, the domestic animals that we usually have, but you know, other primates, things that are a little bit closer to us. And uh, can you turn the yeah, can you turn that on? You know, I was thinking about our primate cousins, the ones that we share about 97, 98 percent of our DNA with. We have so much in common with them; they might as well, you know, line our bedroom walls. So I was thinking, wouldn't it be cool if I got a chimp or some other sort of monkey? Oh, baby boy capuchins, socialized and stunningly beautiful. They even wear diapers. Look at this. Aren't they cute? Look at that. You can have it with your baby. They can play with it instead of a stuffed animal. What do you think? Wouldn't you just love to get one? Yeah. All right. Hey, how about this one? This one. Where's, he's diaper trained, he's leash trained. Hey, imagine we could teach him how to, how, teach her how to pole dance. Yeah, watch Animal Planet. What do you think? Great idea, huh? Up for adoption. I can get three for the price of one and they're even uh, out of diapers. So I don't have to deal with that. After all, I gotta uh, keep up with the Kardashians, right? So I thought, I'd ask my friend Priscilla Farrell, president of Friends of Animals and Primarily Primates. She knows all about them. I thought, hey, I'd love to get a primate. What do you think, Priscilla? Is that a, a good idea? Well, it, it's a perfectly terrible, expensive idea. And there's a chimpanzee breeding mill in Missouri that will sell somebody a chimpanzee over the internet for fifty to sixty-five thousand dollars, and the truth is, Michael Jackson had one. Entertainment industries have them. There's a new film coming out in December that Leonardo DiCaprio stars in, that has a performing chimpanzee in it, called Chance, who lives in Florida. These animals get pushed around, beaten up to perform for about the first six years, and then they start pushing back. And when they push back, and they have perhaps 10 times the strength of a human being, they get relegated somewhere else, meaning they're sold to a lab, an exhibitor, or some other such awful place. The idea of exotic animals, whether it's chimpanzees, lemurs, monkeys, Fitting into the scheme of family life in a human dwelling is a perfectly terrible idea. Yet, it's a profit-driven industry that is unfortunately catastrophic. And the upshot of that means you've got a lot of animals deprived of the kinds of lives they're supposed to have that are operating as our either commodities or surro surrogate children. All right, so Priscilla, thank you. You know, you just deterred me from adopting a chip. Um, so what, just tell me, when they get over to primarily primates, your, uh, oh, there we go. Can you tell us a little bit about the kind of lives they, the, the second life they get? Um, 
the chimpanzee at the bottom, who was, uh, we asked, what would you like to choose from uh, for today's produce? And Dieter, his name, um, decided tomatoes and strawberries. So he's running off with three of those containers. <laughs> Dieter was born to a chimpanzee named Betty. And Betty came from Colston Foundation, which supplied the US Air Force with all of their chimpanzees for experimentation. Primarily Primates was awarded 30 of these chimpanzees in a release program to get them out of research. Dieter was a baby who couldn't drink his mother's milk because she was drinking her own milk. To the right is another chimpanzee enjoying watermelon who came from a Missouri basement and he lived 12 years of his life there until the couple in their 70s decided he was altogether too much. He arrived at Primarily Primates four years ago. Right away we got him a vasectomy, moved in four females to share a very large 20 foot high, 60 foot long, 40 feet wide enclosure outside. And those animals all together figured out what it was like to have a family of chimpanzees and to identify with their own species rather than to be imprinted on us. And there are many, many other stories, but the, the truth is they're never going to figure out what it's like to be a lemur or a monkey or a chimpanzee by being human imprinted and living within our households. We have to allow them the dignity of finding each other and finding that socialization and going through that rehabilitation because at the very least we owe them that much when they're released from an animal exploitation industry. Thank you, Priscilla. Okay, I gotta tell you, I was just kidding when I said I was thinking about adopting a chimpanzee. I hope you guys don't think badly of me. I mean, I would really do that. All right, here. So here's some pictures of uh, life at primarily primates here. They're getting, they're having a lot of fun here. All kinds of monkeys and apes and things remaking a life at primarily primates. So they've had a, a really wonderful second life there, or they are continuing to have a wonderful second life. Now, I'm gonna switch gears here and just talk about something else. Now, well, as vegans, we all try to avoid uh, animal products. Uh, dairy and meat and eggs because we know what it does to farm animals and there's a lot of organizations that help out farm animals and we know about the effects of um, well the well-known equation meat and dairy and eggs equal global warming obesity and hypertension and and uh, heart disease and all a host of other illnesses and it also equals cruelty to animals, which is one reason that it's so prevalent in our minds as vegans. Um, I know Colleen just spoke about that as well too. But we often don't think about other vegan foods that we eat or foods that we consider to be vegan and the impact they have on a different type of animal. So I want to take a look at that for a second here. All right, what's wrong with these pictures here? We've got uh, some yummy looking butter there. We've got some cream cheese frosting, some yummy peanut butter, and some vegan shortening. And I bet a lot of you use these products uh, in your baking or your cooking, and I certainly have myself. But what's wrong with them? Does anyone know? Palm oil. That's right. There is something called palm oil. Let me see if I can get this thing to work here. So there's that yummy butter and the cream cheese frosting. There's the peanut butter. Come on. <laughs> All right, let's get this clicker to work here. Come on, come on, where's the next slide there? All right, here's a whole sampling of other popular products that contain palm oil. Did you know that palm oil is in about 50% of all consumer goods? So it's in everything that you use. I mean, stuff in my house I didn't even know about. Shampoos, toothpaste, tons of mane, um, you know, cleaning products, just about everything uses this cheap, uh, highly producible oil, palm oil. And what is wrong with that? I mean, now these are just the, uh, the regular, you know, mainstream consumer products, but I could find a, I could create a, a poster there of vegan or eco, so-called eco-friendly organic products that also contain palm oil as well too. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about, if I can get this clicker here to work here. Um, 
Priscilla, can you tell us a little bit about what palm oil does and why we don't want it? Well, it's the cheapest oil in the world, unfortunately. So there are a lot of financial interests interested in palm oil plantations. And for great apes known as orangutans, who depend on two habitats, it's Malaysia and Indonesia. And 85% of all the palm oil comes from Indonesia. That means you have a massive, massive amount of habitat that's being erased. By erasure, I mean deforested, trees are cut down, the area is burned. Orangutans that have to ex escape this kind of burning of their habitat run into villagers and people in local areas with agriculture. They raid the crops and in turn they're killed or they're captured for some kind of trade. The truth for orangutans, they've got maybe five years left before they are extinct in nature unless we decide that palm oil is not going to be in the food we're selecting. In addition to this uh, decimation of orangutans, You've got problems for chimpanzees in Cameroon. You've got problems for monkeys, highly endangered animals called drills, because palm oil plantations are planned there too. And companies are racing to destroy rainforests that these trees preserve our atmosphere. They're necessary for primates so that they can thrive whether you're talking about Central America, South America, Africa, Malaysia, Indonesia, there is a fast move to erase rainforests so that palm oil can be cultivated. What are, are there any other animals besides primates? What about uh, Sumatran tigers and elephants? Uh, and there are all sorts of other forms of wildlife, and they are the true victim of palm oil. Uh, Production and just I just want to reiterate that we are orangutans are facing extinction within five to fifteen years if we can continue to consume palm oil. So this is something that each and every one of us can do. We can choose with our forks and with our with the products that we choose to buy. We can choose not to buy palm oil. Um, so I you know I also want to talk a little bit about what's called. Okay, here are all these other products here, not products. Palm oil by any other name. You guys know that um, line from Romeo and Juliet, a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. Well, palm oil by any other name would smell as rotten, and these are all the names of palm oil that you're going to find. Get familiar with them. So anything, any shampoo, anything that suds with sodium lauryl sulfate, that is palm oil. Uh, stearic acids and all kinds of uh, um, F facial products, that sort of thing. So take a look at all of this. Anything that has palm, like vitamin A palmitate, that is also palm oil. So try to remember this list. I am just learning myself, and I'm going through all of my household supplies and just becoming appalled at how many of them contain palm oil. Um, all right, so the next question is, is there something called sustainable palm oil? And I want to talk about that for a second because there are vegan uh, companies that are on the bandwagon and they have joined an organization called Roundtable for Sustainable Palm Oil. And they are now saying, hey, my palm oil is fine. We're sourcing it from uh, places that are outside of Indonesia and Malaysia, you know, like Africa, where they've had palm trees forever and it's perfectly fine. But the question is, is it really, really fine? First of all, there's only about 10% of all the world's palm oil, which is... Uh, are produced by members of the Roundtable for Sustainable Palm Oil, and of that 10%, most of it is what is called book and claim CSPO. Now what that means, it's just like carbon credits. It's called, you get some, you buy things called green palm certificates, and it's just like buying carbon credits. So you're actually buying non-sustainable palm oil, but you're paying money that will go towards producing sustainable palm oil in the future. I don't think that's a really great way to go. Um, and so there are many, many members that will have that little sticker on the product saying it's made it with uh, sustainable palm oil, and they are members of Roundtable for Sustainable Palm Oil, but only a percentage of them actually uh, report 
what percent of the palm oil they produce is truly sustainable. Um, and if you look at the list, if you go to the World Wildlife Fund and look at the, uh, the stats there, it's really, really pretty surprising. So even with that little sticker, you know, maybe only 25% of yours uh, came from buying green palm certificates, but you got that sticker anyway, uh, misleading consumers into thinking that it's perfectly fine. Whether it's all mixed together and you think you've got the good or you've got the bad, avoid it all like the plague. And if I can volunteer the, the politic of earth balance, vegan margarine, they use palm oil. I think you ought to boycott every single product they put out until they change and use a different oil. I think that's a good campaign, a good focus of where to start. Absolutely, okay, thank you. But. What are you going to do if you like to have a little butter on your bread? I mean, how many of you like earth balance or vegan butter? The ones that are not, I know, I know there's probably the SOS people here who don't eat any oil or salt or sugar, but if you do and you like to indulge a little bit and you like to buy, I mean, um, earth balance, I completely understand because I'm one of those people too. I like to have that little, you know, that creamy substance on my, my bread in the morning. So that's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna make a really fast and easy vegan butter substitute. And we're gonna make some cream cheese. Uh, can we have the lights, please? Thank you. All right, so cream cheese, vegan cream cheese and vegan butter are two of the products in the United States that contain the most palm oil. Almost every single brand contains palm oil. Um, so we're gonna make two of those today. And I don't know how I'm gonna do this, actually. Uh, and then you'll all get samples, because I. Uh, you know what, I'm gonna have to have you hold the mic so I can speak into it as I make it. All right, that's it, all right. Yep, okay, so we're gonna start out with cream cheese. And what I've got, one, I learned this week, or this week, that one of orangutan's favorite foods is our figs. They love figs, they live in these rainforests where there are an abundant, uh, source of fig trees and they stay they stay at the top of the, they never come down to the ground apparently the females they hang out around the top and they just gorge on figs all day long and i am lucky to have two giant fig trees in my yard and they are just bursting with figs they're just falling off the trees so i brought all these figs today and i stuffed them with some cream cheese that i made and uh, sprinkled a few walnuts on top and drizzled them with a little bit of vegan honey and you guys get to have all of that too. So let's start out by making the vegan cream cheese. It's really simple and this recipe is from my book, Artisan Vegan Cheese, which is uh, available outside at Book Publishing Company and I think he's gonna be coming in here with the books so I'll be able to do a signing at the end. Uh, but anyway, let's get started here. So in order to make the vegan cream cheese, this is a cultured food. Meaning, hey, I'll hold it for another second till I actually. Yeah, this is a cultured food, meaning this is not one of those cream cheeses where you put the tofu in the food processor and add a little bit of lemon juice and, and something to make it taste like cream cheese. This is actually made just like cheese, where we are going to uh, puree some cashew nuts and we're going to add yogurt to it, a non dairy yogurt, which is full of lactic acid bacteria. And that lactic acid bacteria will help the cheese culture. And change it from just sort of pureed cashews to a thick, rich, creamy cream cheese in a couple of days. So that's what we're gonna start out with. I've got two cups somewhere here of, hmm, uh, I did have two cups. Okay, um, I'm not sure what, I had another tub up here. I think it got moved. Um, of, okay, maybe I'm gonna have someone run to the kitchen and see if my cashews, I have a, uh, container of cashews in like a yogurt container or something. Um, or it got, I'm not sure what happened to it. So we'll start out with a butter. We'll just change gears. All right, so we're gonna start out with a butter. And this is a coconut oil based butter. And we're gonna start out by using a refined coconut oil. So you don't want scented or extra virgin coconut oil. This is organic refined, that's the key word. If you use the regular or the extra virgin coconut oil, you're gonna have a butter that tastes like coconut oil, which if you like coconuts is fine. I prefer something that tastes just like really rich, creamy, you know, butter, the way that the French have it. You know, you know that they put butter on radishes and salt and they eat it? That's how much the French like butter, okay? So, we're gonna do the same thing here. We're gonna make a really rich, indulgent butter, and I've got some butter spread on some toast. 
So I'm going to take one cup of refined coconut oil, and I'm going to put that right into my blender right here. And this whole butter recipe comes together in about 30 seconds. You'll be surprised. Could you hold that for a second? All right. This is uh, soy. This is almond milk. You can use any non-dairy milk you like. And uh, so I'm going to add a half a cup of almond milk. Um, you can use almond milk. You can use soy milk, whatever you like. You just throw it right in there. Now I'm going to add a quarter cup of canola oil. Now you can use avocado oil or olive oil, any oil that you like will work. And you think something kind of neutral, throw that in there. So, um, yes, this is not oil free, sorry about that. Um, I'm gonna add about two teaspoons of liquid lecithin, and this will help it emulsify and not separate. Uh, you know, it'll keep the liquid and the oil all together. And I'm going to add about a teaspoon of apple cider vinegar, which will give it that sort of cultured butter flavor. And the wonderful thing about you making your own butter is that you can make it as thick as you like or as soft as you like. You can make it whipped. You can flavor it with maple syrup and have maple butter. Um, you can leave it unsalted and, you know, how the French have unsalted butter to make butter creams and things like that. So you can just leave the salt out altogether. I find the commercial um, the commercial butter, vegan butters in the market are a little bit too salty for my taste. So you can decrease the amount of salt you add. I'd like to add about a half a teaspoon. Um, you know, you may want more, you may want less. And that's all the ingredients we're going to add to that. And we're going to turn that on. It's already thickened up, and it's really hot and soft right now, but if you put this in the refrigerator or the freezer for a couple of hours, it will firm up. Um, it'll be just like uh, the, uh, is there a tub of butter around here I can just show them what it looks like? Right in there. Oh, that is really good. It's bigger, it's hand licking good. This is the kind of stuff you'd want to like bathe in if you could. <laughs> or rub it all over your body. Um, oh, okay, that's where the cashews went. They went into Orleans Bay. We found the cashews. Yay! So here's this wonderful creamy butter, and Arlen is the hero of the day for having. And here's the butter after it's chilled. Look at that. Oh my God, it's gorgeous. It's, it's absolutely gorgeous. It, and it, you know, it doesn't have any palm oil. Palm oil has sort of that, just from a culinary standpoint, it has that kind of greasy texture, which sort of coats the back of your your throat. I don't like that sensation. Coconut oil is a lot lighter, so this just sort of melts and just disappears. If, if there's nothing heavy about it at all. And the color is absolutely gorgeous. It's just like regular, you know, some artisan creamery butter. So the other fun thing about it is when you make your own butter, if you have those little silicone molds uh, that you bake cupcakes in or something yeah. like that, you can you can pour this in there and chill it, and then you can unmold it. And you have these little pretty, you know, little pretty shapes of butter that you can uh, serve at your next dinner party. So, do you see how easy that was? And it's so much cheaper. All right. Well, guess what? The cream cheese is just as easy. The only thing about the cream cheese that's different from the butter is that you have to wait a couple of days for it to culture and do its thing. The butter is, in, is instant, and then you have to chill it. But with the uh, the cash with the cream cheese, you do have to wait. Now, what I've got in here, this is not soy yogurt. I have two cups of raw cashew pieces that have been soaked in water overnight to get them nice and soft and easy to blend. 
And in order to make the, uh, the cream cheese, all I'm going to do is add a little bit of sea salt. You want to make sure that you use something like sea salt or kosher salt, a non-iodized salt, because iodine can interfere with the culturing and fermentation process. So just use a regular, uh, you know, like a regular sea salt. And what I have in here, I know it says organic mellow miso, but I make everything and I reuse all my containers. So this is actually soy yogurt that I made yesterday, making using soy milk that I also made. So I've got some yogurt in here, and I'm just going to throw in about a half a cup of yogurt right into my blender. And this recipe is in my cookbook. Um, artisan vegan cheese, and I am now going to blend this. Okay, now if you don't have a high-speed blender, you may want to puree the cashews in a food processor first, just pulse them up and then transfer them to the blender or do it in batches. All right, I want to see how many of you speak the truth. Does this look like cream cheese? Thank you. I got somebody here who's honest. This does not look like cream cheese. To me, this looks like sour cream. And if you were to taste this right now, you'd be pretty disappointed. You'd say to me, Miyoko, it tastes like cashews. Because that's exactly what it tastes like. But what you're going to do with that is you're going to pour that into a container. Uh, the one I just emptied out right here. Here. Uh, this one's still got cashews in it. Let's just empty that out here. So what I'm going to do now is pour this into a container. And I'm going to put a lid on it. And then I'm just going to set it in my kitchen in a warm corner for about two days. And I'm just going to forget about it. I know you're probably thinking you don't like to leave anything out on the counter. But remember, this is full of lactic acid bacteria from yogurt. So it's full of yogurt cultures, and what's going to happen if you put it in a warm environment is that the lactic acid bacteria will start to grow, and the product will, and your cream cheese will start to ferment and culture. And after a couple of days, let me show you what happens. Let's see. All right. I can turn this upside down. Now, does that look like cream cheese? Yes. yes. So that's after two days of culturing. So, thank you. So, and now, and you can tell. Now, how long does it take? I don't know. Um, it might take one day in your kitchen if you live in, you know, in Georgia on a, on a hot summer day. It might take two days in San Francisco. It might take, you know, three days if you're in a colder climate. But you'll know when it's ready because it'll taste like cream cheese, it'll be thick like cream cheese, and it'll have that slightly tangy smell. Can you smell it? Yeah. You'll know when it smells like cream Yes. How much salt? I added about a half a teaspoon of salt, but it's entirely up to you. If you don't want to use salt, you can leave it out. But the salt does help prevent unwanted bacteria, and it does encourage lactic acid bacterial growth, which is what you want. Yes. Yeah. What can I substitute for canola oil? Well, there's no canola oil in no, here. First oh, in my first recipe, you can use olive oil, uh, avocado oil, um, which is fairly neutral. You could use grapeseed oil, although grapeseed oil can make your butter a little green. And second recipe. Yes. You can use almond yogurt, you can use coconut yogurt. You just need some kind of non-dairy yogurt to get the culturing process. The question was, what can she substitute for soy yogurt? And you can substitute any kind of non-dairy cultured yogurt that has live cultures. You have to make sure it has live cultures. Yes? How tightly did you seal the container when you're laying it in? You just put the lid on. Um, 
So, no, not loosely, you actually just snap the lid on because lactic acid bacteria likes anaerobic environments. They don't like lots of oxygen. In fact, that's one way to get mold growth. So you do want to keep it covered. Now we're going to start passing out these samples so you can see how easy it is to avoid palm oil and make these things yourself. How long does that take me to make? And, and you get more than a whole tub, you know, you, you buy an eight ounce container of um, palm oil based cream cheese and that's what, three or four bucks, right? And you've got a whole pound here that you made for, um, I don't know, a couple of dollars. Yes? You can start. Yeah, we're passing, we're going to start passing the, um, the samples out. I think if there's a tray, maybe put it on the trays. Um, so what I've done here, actually, before we answer questions, is I've taken my cream cheese in order to give you, um, yeah, there should be, if we can go get the trays, I don't know what happened to them, we have three trays. Uh, okay, to make the, to flavor the cream cheese today, what we're going to do is take your cream cheese and I'm going to make a lemon cream cheese with an organic lemon. So I've got the lemon here, and I've got a microplane, and I'm going to zest the lemon. Now to zest, it's always a better idea to pull your microplane across the lemon rather than going like this, because you don't want the white part, you want just the yellow part of the lemon. And it's easier to control, and you can see what parts you've gone over and what parts you haven't. So I'm going to throw that in there. Yeah, we're looking for... Oh, no, we can start passing them out if we can get the trays. Okay. And, um, okay, so then I don't have a knife, so we're just going to pretend that I've cut my lemon, and I'm going to put about a teaspoon of lemon juice right into my cream cheese here, and I'm going to add just another dash of salt, and I'm just going to mix it all up. And now I've got this wonderful lemon-scented cream cheese. And what I'm going to do with it now is stuff the figs that I picked this morning from my house. I'm going to chop it. I have some uh, chopped walnuts and I'm sprinkling on top. And then we have some vegan honey. And you can substitute agave if you can't get the vegan honey. It's called bee lime. I don't know where it is. It's around here somewhere. Um, is the vegan honey around here? I just want to... What? I'm not sure what happened to the, the products. I'm in the bag. Oh, it's in the bag. So this is what I use on top of the figs, uh, but you can use agave if you can't get this. This is a really nice, thick, honey textured sweetener. Um, so what you're getting right now is a slice of bread with the, uh, the vegan butter, and you're getting a fig stuffed with a lemon cream cheese, um, walnuts, and a little drizzle of the vegan honey. Um, oh, but you know what? We've got, they ran out of plates. Okay, apparently they ran out of plates but we have more of these. So if you don't have plates, um, you can come up and grab one of these. Um, but these will need to be, uh, these will need to have honey on them. So they're getting, okay, they're coming up with the, the trays now. So, do we have any questions? Yes. You can go ahead and use any kind of coconut oil you like, but it will taste like coconuts if you don't use a refined one. This is an organic refined, it is expeller press, but then they've just refined it to remove the scent from the coconut oil. Yes. I'm sorry, can we have, if, if the vendors, if you could just keep it down for a little bit longer because we're, I, I can't hear the questions, thank you. It lasts for about three to four weeks in the refrigerator. Um, you can freeze it for longer. No. Yeah, that's a very good question. Are there any other questions? Yes. It's soy lecithin. Yeah, the question is, uh, is it what kind of lecithin is it? Um, and that is soy lecithin. That will help emulsify the oils um, with the liquid that's contained in that. Yes. I'm sorry. Lactic acid bacteria is the bacteria that's in yogurt and in anything that's fermented. It's also on the surface of fruits and vegetables. It's in the air around us. So lactic acid is often confused as being, you know, something derived from 
um, milk or lactose. It's not. Lactic acid bacteria is a naturally occurring, that's the friend, what we call the friendly bacteria, or the, uh, the fancy term now is probiotics. When people talk about take your probiotics, they're talking about lactic acid bacteria. It's just a, a trendy term for that. And it's in every food from pickles to sauerkraut to um, yogurt, you know, and there's hundreds and hundreds of different varieties of lactic acid bacteria. Oh. Yes. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. The, the cream cheese lasts, um, it gets tangier and tangier over time. So it lasts about uh, three or four weeks in the refrigerator. Beyond that, you want to freeze it. But this is a cream cheese. Remember, there's no oil added to this. I know the butter is, is nothing but oil, but this has no oil at all added to it. Whereas all the vegan cream cheeses on the market are made out of palm oil or something like that, and as well as isolated soy protein. You can do, you can make any recipe that, you know, you traditionally made using cream cheese using this one. So whether it's cream cheese, some sort of cheesecake or um, croquettes, whatever you normally make with cream cheese, you can use this cream cheese, it works. Um, and the samples are coming out. How do you like them? Is it good? Yeah? We have plenty more. And this is something that you can do. You can help you can help save orangutans by making your own butter or your or your own cream cheese. And uh, you know, even researching other products that you can substitute palm uh, other ingredients for palm oil for. Yes. When is Vegan Mashup coming back? Vegan Mashup, we, this is a TV show that I... Have you guys seen Vegan Mashup? Yay! 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 It's, and Friends of Animals was a sponsor of Vegan Mashup. This is the and, 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 end of the new series. We're going to start filming season two in October. This is a show that is produced by Delicious Television, Delicious TV, and it aired in 288 million homes across the nation. Yes! It's a fun cooking show featuring not just one, not just two, but three vegan chefs on every episode. Um, and I'm honored to be one of them. Terry Hope Romero is um, the other, one of the other chefs and Tony Fiore. And we also have wonderful guests on it. Last season we had Chef AJ and Colleen Patrick Boudreau who, who talked earlier and, and Brian Terry. This season we're going to have Julie Hassan and um, Fran Costigan, who just came out with her new chocolate, vegan chocolate book. So we've got lots of exciting new people on season two of Vegan Mashup. It will start airing again next spring, I believe. Yeah. Yes. Now, Rejuve, uh, you could use Rejuvelac, it will be a different cheese. It'll be more like a chef, and that's that's perfectly fine too. Actually, the recipe for the big stuffed cheese in my book calls for that cheese instead, but I wanted to demonstrate cream cheese because it's a more common cheese. So you can use one or the other. I'm sorry? Yeah, I don't really recommend using probiotic powder for a couple of reasons. One, there are very few probiotic powders that are vegan. Uh, two, they're very expensive. And three, most of them are monocultures, meaning there's only one strain of bacteria in it. And you don't get the full range of flavors. So you get sort of a flat profile. So I really recommend people make their own natural cultures at home, either Rejuvelac or yogurt, or you can use sauerkraut juice or kombucha. And what that does is it captures, it continues to capture all the wild yeast and, and uh, lactic acid in the air as well too. And you get a much uh, flavorful, much more flavorful cheese that way. Well, if everyone got a sample, thank you so much for um, joining us today. And I'm going to be somewhere around here, I don't know where, right here, signing books.